Can the delivery of Western tanks become a magic pill for the Ukrainian army? How and for what will they be used? What challenges does this gesture of support from the West bring for the Ukrainian armed forces? And when will the Leopards and Abrams appear on the battlefield? Ukraine rejoices. After months of indecision by German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, the United States was able to unblock the delivery of German tanks Leopard 2 to Ukraine, promising to provide Kiev with 31 M1 Abrams tanks. In response, Germany will send 14 Leopard tanks of one of the most modern modifications to Ukraine, and will also allow the delivery of Leopards to the Ukrainian army by other countries. In total, according to media and expert estimates, the Ukrainian armed forces can be replenished with about 100 new tanks, including a Challenger 2 squad promised by Great Britain. France, at the same time, is considering sending its Leclerc tanks to Ukraine. 100 tanks is it a lot or a little? Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov said in December that only for one offensive operation, the Ukrainian armed forces need at least 300 tanks. The question arises, how effective will the arrival of new tanks be in the context of the ongoing hostilities? In order to understand this, it is worth considering the advantages and disadvantages of the Abrams and Leopard tanks compared to Soviet and Russian tanks. In 2022, the delivery of modern HIMARS rocket fire barrage systems considerably relieved Ukraine's task of occupying the areas of Kherson and Kharkiv, as Russia currently lacks similar high mobility and accurate weapons ready for use. The situation is different with tanks. Leopard and Abrams tanks, in many parameters, only slightly surpass modern Russian T-19 tanks and are inferior in some aspects. What are the most appropriate Russian tanks to compare with the Leopard tanks? The T-9 Deem, the latest Russian tank, is closest to the Leopard 2 a 6. The early modifications of the T-90 or T-80U are closer to the Leopard 2 a 4. Both of these are tanks from the 1980s, but there was already a noticeable technological gap between the Soviet Union and Western countries at that time. What are the main advantages of the Leopards over Soviet and Russian tanks that are similar in characteristics? The main advantage is in automation and control. The fire control system FCS is just a small part of it. The tank's information and control system is all automation. For example, in Russian tanks, regardless of the modification, levers are used to control the vehicle. There is even a saying to sit behind the levers. In the Leopard, a steering wheel, or roughly speaking, a steering wheel is used. Most Russian tanks do not have a foolproof system. When you pull two levers at the same time, your engine will fail and you'll be in trouble. In the Leopard, this system is fully automated and such a situation cannot occur. The T-90 and the latest modifications of T-72 and T-80 BVM tanks have protection against random events. Operating Russian and Soviet models requires manual operation for many tasks. Even starting the tank is a matter of pressing four hypothetical circuit breakers and some additional actions. Bringing the weapon from the march to the combat position is also the result of pressing a large number of buttons in the correct sequence, which complicates the entire process. The Leopard has the maximum automation, and its modernizations are constantly moving towards automation processes transferring these mechanical buttons to automation to reduce the air rate and load because in stressful situations, you can simply forget or confuse the sequence, and any problem can threaten the destruction of the machine in combat conditions. This is both good and bad, because the repairability of electrical equipment directly depends on the simplicity of its composition. When you have a fuse on each switch, you can replace it. When you have an automated unified safety system, its repair will not be as simple as replacing a fuse. For many decades, ergonomics have been a key focus in the development of Western tanks. These seemingly small details, such as the placement of sights for comfortable head positioning and comfortable seats, make the Western armored vehicles made for people, as Ukrainian tankers and motor riflemen say. In Leopards, there is even a step above the driver's seat so you can step on it with dirty feet instead of the seat when getting in the tank. This is something that was impossible in Soviet machines. This can be compared to the difference between cheap foreign cars and Soviet cars from the 1980s, 
where the appearance and characteristics were similar, but foreign cars were much more thoughtfully designed. Accuracy of shooting. The accuracy of shooting depends on proper weapon alignment for normal combat, zeroing, and the quality of the crew. It also depends on the maintenance of the tank before shooting, the wear of the barrel, if the barrel was changed, and if the weapon was zeroed. Most Russian units do not conduct zeroing. This was the main problem even in peacetime. Tanks were not only unzeroed, but nobody knew how to zero them. Accuracy also depends on the overall fire control system and the crew's ability to use this system. It is difficult to learn this immediately in real combat conditions. The role of automation and optical means is also important. Accuracy will vary with time of day. The thermal vision system Leopard will work at night, but many Soviet tanks either do not have it or it is faulty. The quality of range finders, on the same T-72, the range finders are of rather low quality. They do not capture targets through dense vegetation, through leaves, etc. The overall quality of the fire control system in Western tanks is better because they are newer generation systems. Meanwhile, the guns on Western and Soviet tanks are comparable. They are almost on a par here. In this war, there are almost no direct tank battles. Throughout the war's history, you will find a maximum of 10 videos where tanks are fighting tanks. The probability that the hypothetical Leopard will enter into direct fire contact with some Russian tank is small, and if this does happen, then most likely in such conditions where one tank defeats the other by definition. For example, you suddenly jumped out from behind a corner of urban development or from an ambush. The enemy is facing you side, not expecting this and then the crew's mastery will affect the outcome of this duel more than the characteristics of the guns. The main purpose of tanks in this war is to support infantry, destroying enemy fire points, breaking through defense and fortifications, destroying machine gun and mortar nests, positions of anti-tank guided missile operators and grenadiers, destroying armored or unarmored vehicles if they are in the way, destroying live forces if they are infantry advancing on the field is also a goal. The objectives of tanks in modern warfare are not much different from infantry objectives. They support and complement each other. Dimensions In the use of tanks, dimensions are an important aspect. The entire Soviet tank doctrine was built on having the lowest possible profile of the vehicles. This partially explains the poor ergonomics and discomfort inside Soviet tank models, as they were tight and compact, but also harder to hit. The Leopard 2 is a relatively high tank, with a lot of space inside, but this is also its weakness. This applies not only to the Leopards, but to all European and American tank building in general. As previously mentioned, tank battles are now rare, and tanks usually face anti-tank missile systems, and it's easier for the ATGW operator to detect and hit a larger target. The higher your dimensions, the faster you will be detected, and if your tank is detected, it's likely to be hit if the ATGW calculation is at the required range and has the ability to shoot at you. The correct tactical work of the crew is tasked to handle this. Western tanks, including Leopards, are protected from Soviet and Russian ADGM strikes in the sector 20 to 30 degrees, which is a very narrow sector. A shot at an angle of 45 degrees from the tank axis already represents a great risk, not to mention a direct hit to the hull it's not possible to defend the tank well from all sides. The tank can only be well protected in a narrow sector, and well-trained tankists should constantly strive to expose their tank with the front part facing potential enemy fire. Armor One shouldn't consider armor in modern warfare as a very important factor. Most tanks destroyed in this war are defeated by Agams, and Agams don't care about the armor of a tank, except for a narrow sector of frontal armor. There is some superiority in armor for the Leopards, but it is not very significant if comparing the Leopard 2 a 4 with the T8 Zeru or T9 Zeroa, and the Leopard 2 a 6 with the T90. The T90 and T80 have the same problem. They have exactly the same sector in front where they are protected, and there is no protection in all other sectors. Crew, 4 against 3. It's a problem in vacuum because the fourth person is the charger and has minimal function. Yes, he should be able to replace other crew members, so he should also be prepared. 
but it's not a big difference. Just need to prepare a bit more tankers. But a larger crew has an advantage when there is a need to quickly service the tank. When the Swedes developed prototypes of their Sturv 103 tanks, they wanted to make the crew of only two people, but they conducted research and found that it was not right, not even in terms of maintenance, but in terms of psychological impact. The smaller the crew, the greater the psychological burn. In non-standard situations, in combat conditions, anything can happen. A large crew is not always a problem, but sometimes an advantage. Making Soviet tanks small and low allowed for automatic charging. They don't need a charger. It disappeared from the crew, and there's no need for space for it. At the same time, due to the location of the projectiles inside the tank, Soviet and Russian tanks are more prone to exploding ammunition with an automatic charging system. If you have a lot of space in the turret, the likelihood of a detonation of ammunition is lower. In Soviet and Russian tanks, the projectiles are everywhere. Even the driver mechanic has a couple of them. The smaller the tank, the greater the likelihood of hitting the ammunition. There are other reasons as well. The T-64, T-72, T-80 Soviet tanks have a projectile charge not enclosed by a metal casing from all sides, like NATO tanks or T-62, and it is much easier to ignite such a charge in case of hitting some small fragments, sparks, etc. Abrams tanks have places with cutout panels where you can place ammunition, and there are places where there are no such panels, and in the event of ammunition being hit, their turrets fly off many meters upwards. In Soviet and Russian tanks, the projectiles are not well protected, which increases the likelihood of detonation. In Soviet tanks, there is a place for shells in the automatic loading mechanism, and there is a place for shells in the combat compartment. If the shells are only in the automatic loading mechanism, then there is less chance that the entire ammunition supply will explode. We have already seen reports from the front that both sides have started using this tactic. They drive into an area where they can be hit with a minimum of ammunition, only with the shells that are in the automatic loading mechanism. If the tank catches fire and it is not quickly put out, it will be lost anyway. The tower explosions that we see during this war often occur after three to five minutes of fire, during which time, if the crew is alive, they can escape from the tank. And if they are severely injured and cannot escape from the tank, then they will burn regardless, whether there is an ammunition explosion or not. Projectiles 120mm caliber projectiles used in Leopards are widespread throughout Europe. But we are interested in how widespread they are in Ukraine, there they are not widespread at all. A ammunition shortage can occur with any logistical problems. You need to specially transport ammunition for these tanks and set up separate logistics specifically for the Leopards, and that is a problem. In Europe, there are no problems with 120mm shells. There are large stocks and a huge choice. There are tens of types of these shells there. They are in service in many countries and are interchangeable. Yes, there are nuances. You cannot replace armor-piercing subcaliber with fragmentation high explosive, but fragmentation cumulative with fragmentation high explosive can be replaced within certain limits. Problems may arise in delivering these shells to the line of combat where these tanks will be used. In practice, the overwhelming majority of shells used by tanks in modern war are fragmentation high explosive. Cumulative and armor-piercing shells are needed in rare tank battles to penetrate the armor of enemy tanks. Leopard Battle Experience Leopards were used in Afghanistan without casualties. They mainly had to deal with improvised explosive devices because the Taliban had almost no anti-tank weapons. In Syria, the Turkish army's leopards had to confront Kurdish Agams, and the Kurds effectively used these relatively old Agams to destroy, for example, three tanks in December 2016, and in February 2018, a Leopard 2 of 4 was destroyed. All these hits were, of course, not in the frontal sector and in these conditions. The leopards held up very well in terms of turret protection. Maneuverability and Mobility the use of leopards in Ukraine will be the first in temperate climate conditions. Leopards will learn what maneuverability is and we will only observe how well they cope with it. Basically, it's tracked equipment, 
and for tracked equipment, maneuverability is not a big problem. If the Ukrainian counterattack is planned for April, then at least in Zaporo's high and Kherson region it will already be quite dry. In the Donbass there may still be maneuverability or even negative temperatures, but this is not the Siberian condition. In general, all tracked vehicles, both Soviet and Western, with few exceptions, have roughly comparable characteristics in terms of behavior on rough terrain. On rough terrain, both tanks and BMPs behave relatively well. Rough terrain can be a bigger problem, for example, for trucks that will have to supply these leopards with the same 120mm shells. If 125mm shells for Soviet tanks can be quickly borrowed from some neighboring unit, sometimes captured from the enemy, it is not possible to do so with 120mm shells. Additionally, heavier machines on average consume more fuel, which also needs to be transported by wheeled vehicles. For rough terrain, it is important to have pressure distributed evenly on each track. The wider the track, the better the passability. The main problem with mobility for these tanks is not the entangling, but crossing bridges. Abrams are heavier than Leopards, and Challengers are heavier than Abrams. Finally, the heavier the tank, the fewer means there are to extract and evacuate it. A Soviet tank can be attempted to be dragged by almost anything. Germany has already supplied Ukraine with repair and evacuation machines Burge Panzer II, which are precisely intended to extract tanks from the mud. And if they have already entered into some Ukrainian military units, they will probably have to be removed in order to equip a new brigade with heavier Western tanks. With the Abrams, the situation is worse. They are even less adapted for crossing bridges. Not only because the bridges were built during the Soviet era to accommodate Soviet tanks, but simply building a bridge that can withstand 60 tons is more expensive and complicated than building a bridge that can withstand 50 tons. The Soviet Union planned to move equipment weighing up to 50 tons, so it built bridges that can handle the passage of a 50-ton tank. No one planned to drive over these bridges on a 60-ton tank, let alone a 70-ton tank. Abrams is a very heavy tank, and the heavier the tank, the more problems it presents. Fuel and Maintenance Nearly all Western and nearly all domestic tank engines, with very few exceptions, are multi-fuel. They can all consume gasoline, kerosene, and diesel fuel. The only difference will be the power output by the engine and its consumption. These are tanks of the end of the Cold War period. They are all multi-fuel, that was the requirement at that time. It can only be assumed that Western technology is more demanding in terms of fuel quality and that the service life of its engines on poor fuel is less. There will be much more differences in the oils and coolants used. All Western tanks require completely different brands of oils, both engine and transmission. These oils are an additional headache for those who will provide the rear, who will supply these tanks, so that nothing breaks inside them. Because if you pour the wrong oil into them, some expensive system may fail. The difficulty of repairing Leopards or Abrams tanks depends on the type of damage or malfunction. Some repairs can be done on-site, right on the battlefield. Some can be repaired on an improvised repair base, where only a crane is needed to lift a heavy part. In the third case, the tanks have to be transported for repair to Poland. The power plant of the Abrams is considered more voracious because of the gas turbine. Logistically, it's easier to supply a tank that consumes less fuel. When the US used these tanks in Iraq, they had a hard time repairing and supplying them with spare pots, and recently they expressed concerns that the Ukrainian rear may not be able to withstand this. It's important to understand that the logistics load adds up, meaning that you can take resources from repairing 3T-72 tanks and instead, for the same amount of time and with the same resources, Repair one Leopard tank and one Abrams tank. This means that you have to transport the 3T-72 tanks somewhere else to repair them. On the other hand, much Western equipment has well-designed mechanisms to mitigate this issue, such as lightened aggregate repair. Both the T-80 and the Abrams can easily replace their entire engine and transmission with another functioning one if available, whereas replacing the engine or transmission of a T-72 is a much more complicated task. Some even argue that the mechanics and military units equipped with T-72s know and work more because they have to constantly repair something. 
whereas the aviators are lazy tank drivers who simply replace the whole aggregate. Tactics of usage. Western tanks can't be distributed along the entire front line. They must work as part of one overall unit. It's not possible to spread them out over a large section of the front due to logistical considerations. You simply won't be able to supply them with ammunition, oil, and spare pots. This can only be done if they are brought together in one formation, into a single striking fist. If the hypothetical T-72 tanks can be distributed among various units, and any unit with a T-72 can service it, then this is not the case with Leopards. Other Western Tanks From other tanks that could be provided to Ukraine, one could highlight the British Challenger due to its insane weight. This tank has several shortcomings. Firstly, its ammunition is not interchangeable with the ammunition for the Leopards and Abrams, meaning a separate logistics chain will have to be built for them. In addition, the Challenger has too weak an engine for such a weight, and it is less energy armed than the T-72. It cannot be excluded that the Ukrainians simply will not put them on the front line. They will place them on some safe direction where they will be used as static fire points, and from this direction they will remove some T-64, T-72 or D-80 tanks and send them to the line of contact. From a practical point of view, a tank weighing 70 tons is a torment. Theoretically, Ukraine can do the same with the Abrams. Regarding the French Leclercs, they are a very good, modern tank. It has an automatic loading system. It was equipped with a tank information and control system ticks from the beginning, while the Leopards and Challengers were only upgraded later. Otherwise, the Leclercs are not much different from other Western tanks. In conclusion, no matter how many shortcomings a tank may have, it is better to have it than not. This equipment will be useful for Ukraine in any case, especially in expected offensive operations. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. We'll be back with more updates and information tomorrow. Thanks for watching.